Nikola Tesla Recent evidence has surfacing detailing that Nikola Tesla was murdered the day after he was visited for an all-day interview with two Secret Service agents, Reinhard Galen and Otto Skorzeny. After suffocating him, they stole all of Tesla's blueprints and papers. Otto Skorzeny was Hitler's bodyguard and also an assassin, one of the many Nazis, who exfiltrated to the USA after WWII, as part of Project Paperclip. Many of these Nazi scientists ended up working for NASA, the CIA, and other US secret services. Although he supposedly died in 1975, Skorzeny resurfaced in 1999. In a deathbed confession to the man who was dating his daughter, he revealed the identity of Tesla's assistant, who was stealing from him. This man, he said, known as George Scherf SNR was none other than Prescott Bush the father of the 41st president of the US, and grandfather of the current president. Interestingly, an article published in the Idaho Observer has since been removed, although several copies were made of it before it was taken offline. A copy of the article can be found here. Part 1 Deathbed Confessions Photos support claims that George H. Scherf F. Jr. was the 41st U.S. President by Don Nikoloff according to Otto Skorzeny, pictured as the Scherf family in a few friends circa 1938. Holding Mother Scherf's hand at left is Martin Bormann. In front is Reinhard Jlun. In back is Joseph Mangala and to his right is Skorzeny as a young man. At center right in the German Navy uniform is George H. Scherf, Jr. and his father George H. Scherf, Sr. Bormann became Hitler's second in command. Reinhard Jlun was a chief SS officer and assassin, who was smuggled out of Germany under Operation Paper Ecoliep. Skorzeny was Hitler's bodyguard and SS spy assassin, who came to the U.S. after the war under Project Paper Ecoliep. Skorzeny and G.H.W. Bush were instrumental in merging Nazi SS intelligence with the OSI, to form the CIA with Wild Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles. These guys were also part of CIA mind control experiments such as MKUltra. SS officer and physician Joseph Mengele, the notoriously sadistic angel of death of Auschwitz, escaped Germany to South America after the war. George H. Scherf, Jr became the 41st President of the United States, as G.H.W. Bush and George H. Scherf, Sr., was Nikola Tesla's trusted assistant. What you are about to read is another step beyond research pioneered in the early 90s by author-historian Webster Tarpley based largely on deathbed clues provided by former Hitler bodyguard Otto Skorzeny and his box of photographs. Since Skorzeny's death in 1999, the various leads he provided have been followed up and tend to support what, at first blush, would appear to be the unbelievable rantings of an embittered old man. What remains constant, as we pour through publicly available official records, private correspondence, memoirs, newspaper articles, photos and other clues is that Bush family records the ones that exist are a puzzle palace of inconsistencies and curiosities. Since it is a congressionally established fact that Prescott Bush was in business with the Nazis during WWII, we can safely say that the Bush-Nazi connection existed. Who are the Bushes? How did they get connected with the Nazis? Is the connection still alive through US Presidents George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush? The answers are not as literal as we would like them to be. But we have the testimony of Otto Skorzeny and his photos especially the one at right. So, here we go the first installment of an investigation that points to a curious conclusion. The Bush family was created to destroy America. What we are taught about history in American schools is not history, but a fairy tale. Better yet, it is propaganda designed to hoodwink an unsuspecting society about its true heritage and the treasonous acts and sabotage that were conceived in order to bring about a new world order. You are about to learn the real identities of those who have infiltrated your nation on behalf of secret society's intent on bringing about the total slavery of mankind. In the past, others have written about the numerous conspiracies to control natural resources, energy, food and our sovereign right to live on planet Earth not as slaves of a wealthy few but as free men, women, and children exercising the free will given to them by God. 
research is the systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources, in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. This is important research. Read it carefully, with an open mind. Considering the use of fluoride sodium fluoride, in drinking water and toothpaste, you may already be in denial. Fluorides we are told are for the prevention of tooth decay. You, the reader, can decide if they really work. The real reason they are added to your drinking water and toothpaste is to cause you, to become physiologically and physically placid, and therefore, apathetic. A thought problem imagine you were a member of a secret organization, whose sole agenda was to control the entire planet. If your plan was to accomplish this goal without being perceived by your intended victims, discretion would be paramount. Your organization would devise a series of historical events that, on the surface, would appear to be everyday, happenstance occurrences natural disasters, man-made diseases, acts of murder, assassination, terror, manipulation of money and energy supplies, contamination of foods, pollution of natural resources, and war. The timing of these events would require patience, careful planning, cooperation from others in positions of trust, stealth and deceit. In essence, the whole mission must derive its power through deception and concealment and must have a master plan. Who were the designers of this master plan? Follow along as we connect the dots. The master plan, arrival of the bankers at the turn of the 20th century, a plan to slowly take over the government of the United States began to unfold. Many works have been written about the Nazi machine that instigated two world wars, though few have traced the footsteps of the foreign financiers and the actors we prefer to call politicians. A brief glance at shipping records, passenger manifests, and financial transactions on Wall Street indicates a pattern of deception, which was masterminded by this same machine. The level of cooperation from government agencies and their elected officials was not only disgraceful, but blatantly treasonous. In his book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, one author G. Edward Griffin described the secret meetings, which created the Federal Reserve in 1913. The architect of the plan, Paul M. Warburg, was a representative of the Rothschild banks in England and France and his brother Felix headed the Warburg banks in Germany and the Netherlands. Of significance is the fact that the first official media report about the Federal Reserve occurred three years later. In Leslie's Weekly, two VC Forbes describe the secret meeting between Republican Senator Nelson W. Aldrich and six of the most powerful bankers in the world. That this meeting had to be conducted in a secret, clandestine island location indicates the level of deception, concealment and treason at work. Paul Warburg that Paul Warburg, a German national, spoke English well enough to craft a financial document a volume consisting of 1,750 pages resulting in the Federal Reserve Act designed to control the finances of the United States from Europe was no small feat. A particular interest was, how Warburg was able to establish these important connections prior to his arrival in the US in 1913 and then orchestrate this financial coup. Warburg had to have known his co-conspirators before coming to America. The first official record of Paul Warburg's trip to the U.S. appeared in the Kaiser Wilhelm II Passenger Manifest, upon arrival at Ellis Island, October 13, 1903. 3. The official manifest on line 7 lists a Mr. P. Warburg, age 35 occupation, banker, nationality, American, heritage, German, last residence, Hamburg, final destination, New York, home, 3E 82nd Street, New York. In fact, Paul Warburg claimed he was an American in 1903. Was this claim valid in 1903? Of special interest in this October 13, 1903 passenger manifest, is the fact that other prominent passengers in the elite financial community were also on the same passenger manifest. Harry Sox of Goldman Sachs fame is listed as a passenger but, unlike Warburg, he was not required to declare his destination or his address. In fact, of the 30 passengers listed on page 293 of the Ellis Island database of ship and passenger arrivals, P. Warburg was the only passenger required to declare his destination. Was this an attempt to establish Warburg's nationality? Suspiciously, the second half of the page is missing from the database, 
so we are not privileged with pertinent and official information as to his place of birth nor his physical description on this occasion. Future arrivals to the Port of New York would shed more light on these issues. The record-keeping by the Immigration Office on October 13, 1903, was not merely sloppy. It appears that Warburg and other passengers were not scrutinized to the extent required by law, and were assisted in entering the country with special, yet illegal considerations. Unlike earlier or later arrivals, immigration officers were permitted or instructed to be lax and obviously negligent, in their duties, particularly where destinations and birthplaces were of concern. Warburg's second arrival to the U.S. on the SS Deutschland was similar to his first. Though still a U.S. citizen in 1905, he was demoted to merchant. For however, on a third arrival in 1906, Warburg was, once again, a banker. His memory had failed him on his third trip, when he declared he had never been to the U.S. previously. Neither had his wife and two children, who had traveled with him on prior trips. He had also forgotten about his home in New York City, too, when he claimed he had no address in the United States. On this visit, Warburg declared Hamburg, Germany as his place of birth. Incredibly, on a later visit to the U.S., Warburg claimed he was officially a naturalized citizen, citing the Circuit Court of New York City, March 21, 1911, 5, as the place and date where he had been bestowed his citizenship. Despite Warburg's earlier proclamations, he was not declared a U.S. citizen until the time. Warburg thereby committed perjury, which was overlooked on numerous occasions by the Immigration Service officials, seemingly an act of treason on each occurrence. During subsequent visits to the U.S. in 1910, 1912 and 1913, while again proclaiming his U.S. citizenship, Warburg referred to 17 E. 80th Street, New York as his home address. Not once was there any mention of his association with the Rothschild banks in Paris and London, and his permanent residency in Europe, not in America. Why the deception? James Loeb not to be outdone, James Loeb, a partner in the Kuhn, Loeb & Company banking firm in New York City, traveled with Warburg on October 13, 1903. Loeb declared his U.S. citizenship on this trip, though he apparently suffered from amnesia in 1910, neglecting to declare any country of origin and later, in 1912, declaring to the U.S. Immigration Service that his birthplace was Landsberg, Germany, six a small town west of Munich. Loeb also indicated trip on this that he was staying with Mr. Warburg. Amnesia must have been a disease that plagued most German bankers at the turn of the century. The disease didn't stop there and soon spread to institutes of higher education. Harvard University Press published a memorial biography to the founder of the Loeb Classical Library, bequeathed to Harvard University by none other than James Loeb, one year after his death in 1933. James Loeb was born August 6, 1867, in New York City, the son of Solomon and Batty Goldberg Loeb. Solomon was a partner and founder of the banking firm, Kuhn, Loeb & Company, the tribute began. Seven certainly, Harvard University would have known where Loeb was born and, for that matter, so would have Loeb. If this quotation were true, then what would have caused Loeb, to state to the Inns in 1912, that he was born in Landsberg, Germany? The Harvard Press biography did little to legitimize the matter of Loeb's birthplace, though it was a valiant attempt. Still, if there remained any confusion, the U.S. Immigration Service could have clarified the issue based on the information it had acquired in 1903 and again in 1910. But that was not the agency's intention. The Immigration and Naturalization Service agents were complicit in hiding James Loeb's true birthplace and his association with financiers of the future German Nazi Party, an act which was aided and abetted by the sloppy, incomplete immigration records kept at Ellis Island and the Port of New York. That was part of the deception. Yes, he lived and worked in New York and may have attended Harvard University. But, considering the connections Kuhn, Loeb and company had to the banks that supported the Nazis through money laundering activities until well getting caught in 1942, it was most likely that Loeb like Warburg had been groomed for his role, in order to maintain the founders of this master plan bloodline.
There were other inconsistencies in the Harvard Press biography, again, based upon the above-mentioned records. In the winter of 1891 a severe illness possibly depression obliged him, to give up business and he spent the summer traveling in Scandinavia, returning to banking again only until January 1, 1902, when he retired due to renewed health problems amnesia. James Loeb could not have traveled, and returned to the United States during 1892, unless he had swum upon his return trip. The first of his three voyages to Ellis Island from Europe on the Kaiser Wilhelm II arrived on October 13, 1903, as previously mentioned. It was unlikely he would have returned to any port of entry other than New York, unless he had arrived at some other secret location. And there were no transatlantic airline flights in 1903. The Harvard story had to have been a fabrication intended to hide some dark secret. Considering the sizable endowments Loeb lavished upon Harvard and other notable educational, medical, and art institutions in Boston and New York, it was most advantageous for Harvard to portray Loeb, as a philanthropist and victim of depression hardly fit for a transatlantic swim, than as a German banker, whose father's company supported the master planner's war machine, before enduring two world wars. According to further reminiscent accounts, he retired to a quieter place, his farm at Shrewsbury, New Jersey, moving to Germany in 1905, where he stayed except for a period during World War I until his death in 1933. Evidently, Harvard was unaware of two more trips documented by the federal government, that Loeb made to New York in 1910, and again in 1912. It was no coincidence, that Loeb's return trips to the U.S. As an on-again, off-again U.S. citizen were orchestrated to accommodate Paul Warburg's meetings with Wall Street bankers of German persuasion, as they plotted to create a Federal Reserve System, a foreign entity. On graduation, he received an offer through his teacher and friend Charles Eliot Norton, to study Egyptology in Paris and London. Norton was the appointed professor of history of art at Harvard University. From 1856 to 1874 Norton spent much time in travel and residence on the continent of Europe and in England, and was the first president of the Archaeological Institute of America 1879-1890, according to his biography at Wikipedia.org. Eight it would seem that Egypt was a more suitable location for studying Egyptology than Paris and London, where Paul Warburg managed the Rothschild banks. Loeb died in Munich in 1933, lending belated credence to his 1912 assertion, to the Inns, that he was born in Landsberg, Germany and was a German citizen never having previously been in America. Nikola Tesla Despite conflicting literary and historical accounts, Nikola Tesla, a Serb, was born on July 10, 1856, in Smilja, Lyka province, or what is now modern-day Croatia. Prior to World War I, Smilja was on the border of the Austro-Hungarian Empire so, in effect, Tesla was a citizen of Austrian origin. The son of a Serbian Orthodox priest who rose to the rank of Archbishop, Tesla had the opportunity to study a variety of topics contained in his father's personal library. As a young boy, he accompanied his father on trips to Rome, where he was able to study the lesser-known works stored in the Vatican's vast scientific repository. Upon completing his studies in engineering and physics at the Polytechnic Institute in Graz, Austria, Tesla attended the university at Prague. He demonstrated, early on, an innate ability to solve mechanical and scientific problems, especially in the area of electricity and its applications in power production. After working for Edison Telephone Company subsidiaries in Budapest, Paris, and other cities throughout Europe, Nikola Tesla went to America to meet the man whose company gave him his first job, Thomas Edison. Tesla found it difficult to work for Edison due to Edison's reneging on financial promises, but soon found backers to finance his research and development projects and his new inventions. Financiers, such as John Pierpont J.P. Morgan, George Westinghouse and John Jacob Astor were among those who saw the potential in Tesla's pioneering, entrepreneurial spirit to capitalize on his technological discoveries in electricity, wireless communications, and physics. 
The only official documentation of Nikola Tesla's arrival to the United States was, again, produced at the Port of New York. 9 On April 7, 1882 a 25-year-old Tesla arrived via the SS Nordland, which departed from Antwerp. He had returned, on this trip to the U.S., after lecturing in Paris. Tesla's destination, New York. Tesla immigrated as a laborer, though this label hardly befit the man, who would become the most prolific inventor in history, with some 700 technological patents to his credit. Previous accounts of Tesla's association with Thomas Edison's projects place him in the United States in the 1870s. His many technological discoveries were certain to have drawn the attention of those hungry for world domination and superiority. By and large, Tesla's inventions and his career were excluded from our history books, because his inventions and patents were stolen and then weaponized. It was never intended for us to learn about the suppression of Tesla's advanced scientific discoveries, nor about those who profited from their theft the orchestrators of the master plan. Though much has been written about Tesla's successes and failures, few have detailed the behind-the-scenes financial activities, which disclose a Nazi plot to acquire his technology, while research and development costs had largely been paid unknowingly by U.S. taxpayers. Many of Tesla's patents fell into Nazi hands prior to, and during World Wars I and II. As a result, Tesla continuously found himself in litigation over patent rights and other issues. Although he had succeeded in winning the majority of his patent lawsuits, his technology had been repeatedly stolen and sold to the German Nazis and other foreign governments, so he never achieved the financial success he deserved. The embezzlement of his capitalization went unchecked throughout Tesla's career. At the time of his death by murder, according to Skorzeny on January 6, 1943, Tesla died virtually penniless. Tesla's assistant, George H. Scherf, Sr. Nikola Tesla's successes in discovering new technologies did not go unnoticed by many industrial capitalists and world governments. In fact, many of his inventions were developed through secret government programs, which began soon after his discoveries in alternating current AC, electromagnetic energy, electric motors, generators, coils, radio transmission, energy-saving devices, and wireless transmission technologies. Since Tesla was often buried deep in research at remote labs, many of his financial and legal affairs were supervised by his closest associate, George A. Scherf. Scherf often advised Tesla about pending patent litigation, contracts, proposals, demonstrations, and financial affairs. As any trusty associate would, Scherf stood beside Tesla through all the ups and downs of his financial nightmares, sometimes arranging for extended credit at the Waldorf Astoria, where Tesla often resided, or by obtaining a cash advance toward research he had been contracted to perform. Near the end of his career, Tesla was evicted from the Waldorf for an outstanding bill, which exceeded $20,000 a rather large sum for those days. As Tesla worked on secret U.S. government projects at Colorado Springs, Colorado, Scherf communicated to Tesla the status of his business affairs. Tesla spoke of hopeful, future financial successes, though Scherf repeatedly delivered the news of dwindling funds. Tesla had begun construction of a wireless power transmission tower Warden Cliff, Shoreham, Long Island with funds invested by J.P. Morgan. When Morgan discovered that the tower would transmit free electricity and radio waves, he cancelled the project and had the tower dismantled, then sold for scrap. Morgan was not about to allow Americans to receive free electricity, television and radio. Tesla was devastated when he received the news, but continued on with his new inventions. Some 12 years later, on October 14, 1918, Scherf wrote to Tesla at Colorado Springs. The correspondence focused on the usual disclosure, appending legal issues and attorney matters, and was sent to Tesla on Tesla Company letterhead containing the company's headquarters address at AW 40th Street, New York, NY. 10 On October 15, 1918, the next day Tesla responded to Scherf's letter It seems impossible regarding our understanding of the technology available at the time, but these are the dates attached to the correspondence. An interesting anomaly, Tesla's response was addressed to George Scherf, 
SQ, Union Sulphur Company, 17 Battery Place, New York, NY Union Sulphur Company. 11 This address was not the location of the Nikola Tesla Company. The Rockefeller Connection records show that 17 Battery Place is the Whitehall Building, and was owned by Frank Rockefeller, who, with his brothers William and John D., also owned many of the companies with offices located there. The International Longshoremen's Association ILA had its world headquarters there, as well as a variety of oil, mining, and chemical companies. 12 Though Union Sulphur Company was run by its president, Hermann Frasch, a German chemist who patented extraction methods for sulphur and petroleum, Frasch also worked for John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company in New York, New Jersey, and Cleveland, Ohio, developing similar extraction methods. On the basis of this association, George Scherf, Sr., had connections with the Rockefeller family, though it is unclear if Tesla was at all aware of this connection. Frank Rockefeller was also an investor of Buckeye Steel Castings in Columbus, Ohio. Buckeye manufactured automatic couplers and chassis for railroad cars owned by the Harrimans, the Rockefellers, and J.P. Morgan. Eventually, Samuel P. Bush was promoted from general manager to president of the company after producing gigantic profits. Samuel P. Bush's association with the Rockefellers and his subsequent position as director of the War Industries Board afforded him the opportunity to create contracts with Remington Arms during the war, courtesy of Percy Rockefeller. Nikola Tesla's trusted assistant sometimes referred to as accountant or secretary George Scherf, Sr., worked at Union Sulphur Company. Normally, this association would not set off alarms, considering the state of Tesla's affairs. Scherf had every right to earn a decent living in order to support his family. That was the American way. But a careful examination of Union Sulphur Company might reveal that someone was being deceived Tesla, and Scherf was at the root of this deception. Who was George Scherf? Who was George Scherf? Better yet, who was George H. Scherf, Sr.? There exists no legitimate record of a George H. Scherf being born in the U.S. from the late 1800s through 1925, yet, George Scherf was Nikola Tesla's assistant accountant. If he was born in Germany, could his birthplace shed some light on this mystery? Probably if they existed has become apparent that individuals associated with the Nazi party commonly have all or parts of their genealogical records expunged. We will explore this further in the section of this article dealing with the Bush family tree. Otto Skorzeny, SS. Odessa see a master spy and assassin friends and acquaintances of Nikola Tesla recall him complaining about Scherf's son, George, Jr., always snooping around Tesla's lab. On more than one occasion probably during the late 1930s, Tesla caught the 14-year-old Scherf looking at his notes, poring through his books, and stealing small items from his lab. Tesla gave him the nickname, Curious George and likened him to a mischievous monkey. According to Skorzeny, Adolf Hitler's former bodyguard in the deathbed confession to Eric Orion Eric Berman in S. Miami, Florida, Tesla, hated the younger Scherf. In fact, according to Skorzeny, the Curious George book and movie were inspired by Tesla's suggestion. Curiously, the day before the national theatrical release of the Hollywood production of the Curious George feature-length film, Alan Shulick, the originator of Curious George and the Man in the Yellow Hat, was found murdered under a pile of plastic garbage bags in his driveway in Florida at age 76. 13 In short, Otto Skorzeny claimed that the true identity of George H. W. Bush was George H. Scherf, Jr., the son of Nikola Tesla's illegal immigrant, German-born accountant, George H. Scherf, Sr. The unmistakable Otto Skorzeny with Adolf Hitler. Worth a thousand words, but this was not the only bombshell Otto Skorzeny delivered that day in late 1999. Skorzeny producing a shoebox full of 60 years worth of his personal photographs, showed them to Berman, describing each one in great detail. The collection featured a photo of a young, majestic Skorzeny in full SS Nazi military dress, next to his Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler. 
Then there were photos of Reinhard Slott SS spy and assassin Dr. Joseph Mengele the Angel of Death Martin Bormann Hitler aide and SS assassin and Adolf Hitler photographed in 1997 at age 107. The Hitler photo was taken during a reunion at the Lake McDonald Lodge in Glacier National Park, Montana, on August 27, 1997. According to Skorzeny, Adolf Hitler was alive and well in the U.S. in 1997. Skorzeny did not stop there. He produced a photo of a young Skorzeny, Mengele, Bormann, and the family of George A. Scherf, Sr. Seated in the midst of those in the photo was a young George A. Scherf, Jr., who, Skorzeny explained, was trained as a spy and sent to America to work for Adolf Hitler. He was given false identification and adopted by Prescott Sheldon Bush as his son, George Herbert Walker Bush, scores and he went on. He forged a birth certificate in order to enter the military before he turned 18. He was 16 at the time. In the family photo, a young Scherf and Bormann both sported a German Navy uniform. Scherf later enlisted in the U.S. Navy as George H.W. Bush. In even greater detail, Otto Skorzeny described how contrary to the Sia written history books he helped Hitler escape to Austria in a plane flown by a female pilot, Hannah Reach. Hitler did not commit suicide, Skorzeny recounted. His double was shot between the eyes, and the dental records proved he was not Hitler. The Americans kept it a secret, worried the truth might anger the Russians. Eric Orion Berman, in a live radio interview on Republic Broadcasting Network, January 17, 2006, 14 detailed how Skorzeny died on December 31, 1999. His body was cremated, I have a copy of his death certificate, and I saw his ashes. After the war, he helped George Bush found the CIA through Operation Paperclip in Odessa. Berman recounted how Skorzeny was found not guilty at the Nuremberg trials, and then ushered into the CIA. Some 50,000 plus SS Nazi war criminals, not just rocket scientists, were brought to America after the war. Skorzeny, about age 90 at the time, was described by Berman as very focused and very lucid, and he was still very mobile. He was still able to walk around, he was still very impressive, and he had about the biggest hands I have ever shaken. He was 6 minus 4 and was a giant for his day. He towered over me and I'm 5 minus 8. When asked why he thought Skorzeny entrusted this information to him, Berman responded, I was dating one of his daughters. He knew that I'm Jewish, first of all, I'm an honest guy and he thought that I would really try to do something about this and bring some justice, yeah, to these wanted Nazi war criminals. His whole goal was. They had screwed him over, including George Bush, they screwed him over and out of large sums of money over the years. This was his one last way of, you know, getting even with them. A biographical article about Nikola Tesla appeared in the Tesla Tech, Incorporated Magazine, Extraordinary Technology, Volume 4, Number 3, August, September, October, 2006. 15 The article, written by Dustin Wallace, spoke of Tesla's childhood, some of his inventions, and his last days. Wallace wrote pp. 21 to 22, the Yugoslav monarchy in exile was summoned to visit Tesla in the fall of 1942. However, Charlotte Muzzer, a secretary, paid Tesla the visit. From his condition upon her arrival she felt as, though he may not live through the night. Another friend of Tesla's, Kenneth Swesley visited him during the time, and noted that he was existing on warm milk and Nabisco crackers alone. It was apparent that Tesla was nearing the end of his time. By late December of 1942, Tesla began meeting with two U.S. government agents in order to share some of his most sensitive discoveries. These men carried away many of his documents for microfilming. On January 4, 1943, Tesla's faithful assistant, George Scherf, visited Tesla for the last time. Tesla was found deceased in his hotel room on the morning of January 8. 1943. He had passed away between those four days since Scherf's visit.
The article continued, following Tesla's death the United States Office of Alien Property, under the instructions of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, confiscated all of Tesla's papers and property. This was an interesting maneuver considering that Tesla was a United States citizen. The significance of this benign description of Tesla's inventions and his last days has a direct relationship to the previously unknown claims of Otto Skorzeny. As Skorzeny described Berman in detail his involvement with George H. W. Bush George H. Scherf, Jr. In organizing the CIA by absorbing Nazi SS agents, he intimated that it was Reinhard Jlun and himself who murdered Nikola Tesla on January 6, 1943 by strangulation suffocation. Prior to the murder, Skorzeny and Jlun spoke in great detail to Tesla about his most advanced technologies and then stole the blueprints of his best most secret inventions. Were these the two U.S. government agents, about whom Dustin Wallace wrote? The timing of George Scherf's last visit to Nikola Tesla was suspicious, as well. Scores and he did not stop with these soul-cleansing disclosures. He went on to describe the aliases of himself Frank Edward P. of South Florida according to Berman, who claims he is trying to protect Scores and his daughter, Reinhard Lunhank Yanovic, Wayne, N.J and Dr. Joseph Mangala Stephen Rabel. According to Berman, Jlun was tipped off by the FBI about Skorzeny's unveiling of his identity and location, and Jlun Yanovich then went into hiding. Mangala Rabel, through a series of anti-aging hormone injections, a black hairpiece, and cannibalism has maintained a youthful appearance. Having investigated some of Skorzeny's claims, Berman had contacted the U.S. Justice Department to inform them that Nazi spies were being harbored by certain factions of the U.S. intelligence agencies, 